यम ब्रह्मा वरुणेन्द्र रुद्र मरुदस्तु नंदि दिव्यस्तवैहि वेदैः सांगपदक्रमोपनिषदैः गायन्ति यम सामगाः ध्यानावस्थिततद्गतेन मनसा पश्यन्ति यम योगिनो यस्यान्तं न विदुस्सुरासुरगणाः देवाय तस्मै नमः ओम सुदिस्मृतिपुराणानां आलयम् करुणालयम् नमामि भगवत् पादम् शंकरम् लोकशंकरम् We are now dealing with the fifteenth verse of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita with C. Shankaracharya's commentary or exposition. <coughs> the mantra is this. Yamhina Vyathayan Dede Purusham Purushashrabha Samadukha Sukham Dheeram Sormudattvaya Kalpate He Purushashrabha Yam Samadukha Sukham Dheeram Purusham Ede Na Vyathayan Dede Saha Hi Amrudattvaya Kalpate Who is fit for immortality? Who is the spiritually fit person, the spiritual seeker, who deserves to realize the, the immortal nature of his true personality. That's explained here. The one who is able to look upon pain and pleasure, good and bad, fortune and misfortune, with an equanimity of mind, is the right person fit for immortality. The ability to look upon pain and pleasure with equanimity, with perfect tranquility in mind, comes as a result of transcending both pain and pleasure. The only way to avoid pain is to stop looking for pleasure. Because if we look for pleasure, if we aspire for enjoyment, then naturally we will have to pay a price for it. What's the price? The price is that we may have to be ready to suffer the opposite of pleasure. So one should be able to gain complete mastery and freedom over one's own mind and senses. It's not deadening of the human sensibility, rather it is transcending the duality, the transcending the dvandva, pain and pressure, good and bad, going beyond the opposites. So we already discussed earlier, according to Bhagavad Gita, he is the one who is mentally healthy, who is able to connect his mind, link his mind to something that's, that's beyond mind. Mind should be linked to Atman. So when we get linked to Atman, we transcend the mind. And when we transcend the mind, we go above the mind, above the waverings, above pain and pressure. So we are able to look upon pain and pleasure with the same attitude, with perfect tranquility in mind and with perfect equanimity. So the Bhashigara gives a very beautiful but short commentary on this verse. Yemhi Purusham Sama Dukkha Sukham Same Dukkha Same Dukkha Sahe Yesyatam Sama Dukkha Sukham Sukha Dukkha Prapto Harsha Vishadarahidam Dheeram Dheemandam Na Vyathayendi Na Chalayendi Nityatma Darshanath Ete Yedhoktaha Sitoshnadeha Sa Nityatma Darshan Nishtho Dundha Savishnuhu Amurdhattvaya Amurdhabhavaya Mokshaya Kalpate Samartho Bhavati Who is Samartha? Who is fit to realize immortality, to realize the fact that he is 
none other than the omnipresent, the omniscient, the immortal, immanent Atman. That person is able to treat pain and pressure, good and bad, with the same attitude. And because he is established in perfect equilibrium, the pairs of the opposites, such as heat and cold, Sita, Ushna, are not capable of disturbing him. Because he has reached, he has perceived the reality. So, Yamhi Purusham Sugadukham Same Dukkha Same Yasyatam Samadukha Sukham Sugadukha Prapto Harshavishadirikidam when he enjoys Sukha, he should not undergo the experience of Harsha. Then, when he experiences Dukkha, he will not have any uh, Vishada. So, such a person is Dhiman. That person is called Dhira or Dhiman. Dhiram, Dhimandam, Navethayanti. Such a spiritually enlightened person is not moved, is not afflicted by the prayers of the opposites. Normally when we uh, when we interpret, when we look upon ourselves as this body mind complex, as this body with a mind, with emotions and feelings, then the smallest physical pain can be unbearable when we are at the physical level. Those who are more evolved and those who are living at a higher intellectual level may be able to transcend physical pain when they are engaged in some intellectual activity. If, if you are reading a very wonderful book, a philosophical classic, or even a history or philosophy or if you are reading, if you are a scientist, when you are involved in some very serious scientific experiments and if you have a small physical problem, you won't be aware of that problem when you are uh, deeply engaged in study in a, lab, in a library or in some scientific experiments in a laboratory because you are able to ascend, you are able to lift yourself beyond the physical level, beyond the bodily level. For that moment, you interpret yourself as a basically an intellectual thinking being. If you are a musician, when you are engaged in a musical uh, performance, when you are intensely immersed in that, you will be able to forget physical problems. You may even be able to forget some problems, emotional problems, pain and pressure, disappointment, depression, when you are engaged in painting, in music, or in some kind of activity. Because at that time, you look upon yourself, you interpret yourself as a musician, maybe as a scientist, maybe an artist, so you are able to lift yourself beyond the physical and even beyond the intellectual. Now, if we can lift ourselves and beyond this level and ascend to the spiritual level by linking our mind to its original source of light, that is Atman, then we are able to ascend beyond the physical, beyond the psychological, beyond the intellectual, beyond the aesthetic levels. And from that level, when we look upon these empirical experiences we are, a, we, are, we are able to look upon all these experiences without any uh, any mental wavering without any pain and pressure which means we are able to transcend ourselves beyond and above pain and pressure so we will be able to look upon pain and pressure with the same equanimity of mind Perfect equilibrium of the mind. Siddhya Siddhya Samabhutva Samadhyam Yoga As 
Lord Krishna is going to state later in the same second chapter. Nityatma Darshanat because we are able to realize our true nature, the we are the Atman. And that Atman is Nitya, that Atman is immortal. It is not afflicted by dundas, pain and pressure, good and bad, fortune and misfortune. So when, when we realize our true spiritual dimension, when we realize our true identity with Atman, then we are able to look upon pain and pressure with the same attitude without being afflicted or moved by them. Nityatma darshanat eti jithoktaha sitoshna deha Saha nityatma darshananishtu dundu savishnuhu amudatvaya amudabhavaya mokshaya kalpadi samurtho bhavadi ityatha So such a spiritual seeker is fit for immortality. He has reached the adhigaritva, spiritual fitness to realize his identification with Atman which is immortal, eternal, which is, which, which is the essence of our true personality. Idascha shoka moho akrutva sidoshnadi sahanam yuktam yasmad. Now, to remain in such a situation, that means not yielding to grief and illusion and to be able to bear with cold and heat with the same equanimity, we should reach this higher realization. That is explained in the 16th verse which is very, very important from the Advaitic standpoint. So that is what we are going to discuss next. As an introduction to the 16th verse, Bhashyagara uh, says, Idascha shoka moho akrutva sidoshnadi sahanam yuktam yasmat. How it is going to be possible? The philosophical and spiritual explanation of this spiritual experience, this state of spiritual evolution, is explained in the 16th chapter. <coughs> In this context, uh, the great commentator uh, of Gita, that is uh, Madhusudana Saraswati, he was the one who wrote a famous commentary on Bhagavad Gita. Uh, he, ha he harmonized the bhakti element, the original bhakti element of Shankara Vedanta. Uh, and the highest jnana. Madhusudana, who lived in the 16th century, uh, was both a great jnani and also a great bhakta, and is famous for his uh, magnum opus called Advaita Siddhi. He also wrote this well known commentary on the Bhagavad Gita based on Shankara's Bhashya on the Gita. So, Madhusudana uh, gives a beautiful introduction to the 16th verse. Nanu bhavadu purushai gattum tathapi tasya satyasya jedadushtattu rupaha satya eva samsaraha tathacha sidoshnadi sukhadukha karani sati tat bhogasya avasya gattuad satyasya cha jnanat vinasya anubhavattehi katham tidiksha katham vasaha amrutvaya kalpati now, Krishna Siyabi Dveda Pravanja Siya Atmani Kalpita Tvena Tatyanat Vinasho Vapattehi Sukto Kalpita Siya Rajada Siya Sukti Jnanena Vinasho Vat. So, Madhusodana introduces this important verse. So he explains, Nanu bhavadu purushai gattum tathabi tasya satya se jadat dhrishtat rupaka satyeva samsaraha. Now the purushai gattum, the unitary nature of Atman, how can it contradict the reality of the cycle of the sense world? 
Now, that's a big problem for the students of Advaita. How do you explain the apparent reality of this empirical phenomenal world? When we look around, we are coming in contact with this natural phenomena. The reality of mountains, valleys, rivers, this world, pain and pleasure. So all these empirical experiences seem to be real. And we are not able to realize the reality of Atman. So how do you explain the reality of heat and cold? Or cold and heat, Sita and Ushna. Cold and heat, pleasure and pain are facts of life. We are experiencing the reality of pain and pleasure, heat and cold. So, how do you explain this idea? That's when we realize the immortal Atman, that's our true nature. We are able to transcend pain and pleasure. We are able to remain unafflicted, unmoved, unaffected by the waverings, the changes in our life, the changing experiences of pain and pressure or heat and cold. How does this happen? Mere knowledge cannot do that. Satyasisi jnana vinashanubhottehi Just by, by theory, theoretical knowledge, that we are the Atman, we are not this body, we are not this mind, we are not the psyche. So we need not be afflicted by the cold and heat or pain and pleasure. Just this theoretical conviction cannot uh, help us to wish away, it cannot remove the reality of pain and pressure. So how does it happen? So mere knowledge cannot remove the real visible world of empirical reality. So how does it happen? Katham titiksha, katham vasaha amrutvaya galpate iti chet. How are we able to bear it? And how does this knowledge lead us to immortality? Such a question, such may be asked by the poor Bhakshin. I mean, is a the prima facie argument or the first line of first state of argument, let us say, maybe the a statement from another school of philosophy with the objector's view. When such a question is asked, uh, Madhusudana gives a great famous reply. Now, Krishna Sya Pi Dweda Prabhanjasya Atmani Karpidatvinatanyanat. So the whole world, the, the whole lot of empirical experiences constitute an imposition. It is a superimposition on Atman. It's just like superimposing names and forms on mud or clay by making pots and pans from a heap of clay you are superimposing forms and when the forms become apparent realities you call them by different names so Nama and Rupa are superimposed upon Atman which is devoid of Nama and Rupa Krishna Syabhi Dvaita Prabhanjasya Atmani Kalpidatvena The whole Dvaita Prabhanja this world of apparent reality is really not real but certainly not absolutely unreal which we are going to discuss in the coming Bhashya portions. Tat jnanat Krishna siya bi doida prabhanja siya vinasa vatehi. So once we realize that these names and forms, these emotional feelings of pain and pleasure are nothing but superimpositions on Atman. 
then we are able to transcend this pain and pleasure, this Dvaita Pravancha. But it must be remembered that the entire ramification of dualism is misplaced on self. So once the fact of this superimposition is obvious and clear, then Dvaita Pravancha disappears. So Madhusudana gives uh, a famous uh, illustration here, a metaphor. That is Sukto Karpidasya Rajadasya Sukti Jnana Vinashavat. So if you're walking the seashore or maybe river bank, you may come across uh, um, mother of pearls, uh, things that look like silver, but not really silver. From a distance, when you look at the pieces of mother's mother of pearl, it's called nacre it may resemble a genuine silver because it's brilliant it is effulgent from a distance but when you take it in your hand when you show it against light you realize the fact that it is not genuine silver it is only mother of the pearl so once you realize the delusion of silverness in that mother of pearl suktika Rajada, Rajadattvam is negated when you realize the reality of Suktiva. Then what happens? Rajada Buddhi is also removed. Your wrong notion that it was silver is completely removed. Similarly, when we realize our true nature, when we realize that we have the Atman, the Brahman, that is immortal, that is Nitya, Satya, Suddha, Buddha, Mukta, Subhava. That very moment we are able to uh, lift ourselves above the empirical experiences, the empirical experiences of pain and pressure, heat and cold. So that's a great uh, exposition by, uh, by Madhusudana. So, uh, the simple principle is all these uh, dual experiences of pain and pressure, heat and cold belong to the Vyavaharika level, the empirical level, the relative level. And once we realize that we have a Paramarthika dimension, the Vyadi Atman, then the experiences belonging to the Vyavaharika level are naturally and completely dissolved. This is the great description that Madhusudana gives in the intro by introducing this 16th verse. Now we are going to the 16th verse. Nāsato vidyate bhāvo nā bhāvo vidyate satakha ubhayo rapi dushtvandas tanayo tattva dashibhi asatakha bhāvaha na vidyate satakha abhāvaha na vidyate Anayohu ubhayohu api antas tu tattu dhrshibhi dhrshta. So we have to explain what is, uh, what is the meaning of tattva and what is, who is tattu dhrshi. So the word tattva has got different meanings at different stages of the teachings as well as at different stages of the spiritual spe seeker's progress. Uh, this tattva appears different different stages in the first shatka that is in the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita tattva is only truth of the nature of karma as prescribed and understood by scriptures and realized persons so from first chapter to sixth chapter tattva means the nature of karma so it should be understood uh, in the light of the famous Mahavakya Tattumasi. In the second shatka is the truth seen through love and devotion of the devotee. That's emphasizing the bhakti aspect. And in the third shatka, Tattva means the highest identity of a spiritual seeker with Paramatma. So, uh, Tattva should be understood in the light of the Mahavakya Tattumasi. So Madhusudana and some other commentators have explained this this way. 
So Drishtrava and Drishtrava, these are two important words used in this particular verse. Shows that the Atman as a distinct entity. So Tattu Drishtrava means Tattu Drishtrava is one who has seen Tattva. And this is in itself as different from the stages of underlying it. So we'll, we will go through the commentary. <coughs> Nasataka avidyamanasya sidoshnadeki sakaranasya navidyati na asti bhavo bhavanam astiva astida nahi sidoshnadi sakaranam pramanehi dirupyamanam vastu sambhavati vikarohi saha vikarascha vibhijarati itha ghadadi samsthanam chakshusha dirupyamanam murpitirekena anupalabdhehi asat Tatha sarvo vikaraha karana vidiregena anubala dhehi asan jedna pruddhum sabhyam pragurdhum na anubala dhehi. So, uh, the, the verse is very important, so it will, it will require detailed exposition. <coughs> so, the simple meaning of the verse is this. Something that is unreal cannot have a state of reality or being. And what is real can never be unreal. What is real can never have a state of non-being, just as what is being can never have a state of non-being. The exact state of I mean, the reality of all this have been perceived by great spiritual truths, great spiritual seekers who have realized the truth. Nasataka avidyamanasya sidoshna deke sakaranasya na vidyadi nasti bhavo bhavanam astida. Things such as cold and heat and their causes, which belong to the category of asat. So asat in this particular bhashya stands for mithya that we will explain later as we progress. So cold and heat, pain and pressure and their causes belong to the category of the unreal. Those things, categories which belong to the unreal can never be can never have a state of being real, they can never be real. So what is unreal, what is absolutely unreal, can never be experienced even as an intellectual concept. So that should be understood very clearly. What is, what is absolutely unreal can never be spoken of, can never be written about, cannot even have an in, the state of the reality of a of a intellectual concept even and that which is real can never have a state of being unreal cold and heat and their causes so so nahi sidoshnadi sakaranam cold heat pain and pressure all these and their causes when they are perceived from the highest standpoint, Sagaranam Pramanaiki Nirupimana. When you observe, when you analyze Sita Usna, cold and heat, pain and pleasure, all these empirical experiences. When we go deeper, when we make a thorough analysis of it, then we realize that they really have no reality. No, they don't have the status of reality from the highest standpoint. For all these things, pain and pleasure, they are all changes. They are transfer different levels of changes or transformations. Vikara hi saha. Vikara implies change. Change implies impermanence and what is impermanent can never be real in the absolute sense of the term. Whatever changes, 
whatever undergoes change can never be called real with the capital letter R. That is real in the absolute sense. Vikarishcha vibhijarati yatha ghadadi samsthanam chakshushadi upyamanam mrtvi tirekena anubilabdhekhi asat tatha sarvo vikaraha karna vitirekena anubilabdhekhi asan. Examples are given. Pots, pans, glasses, all these utensils made from clay or earth or soil. They have no existence. They do not have an existence independent of earth or mud. So if you remove all the mud from a uh, pot made of mud, then there is no pot, there is no mud pot. If you remove all the clay from a jar made of clay, then the jar disappears. That means the jar made of clay has no ontological reality or existence independent of clay. Similarly, all effects, all vikarya means effects, cannot have no reality without their causes. So, in other words, clay is real, mud is real, a clay pot is not real because without a clay, without being a pot, the clay can exist. But without clay, the clay pot cannot exist. Without gold, a golden necklace, golden ornament cannot exist. But without being an ornament, gold can exist. So, a golden ornament has no ontological reality independent of gold. So, Bhashigara says, Janma Pradhum Sabhyam Prak Urdham Cha Anubilakthehi Before the production of the pot made of clay, that pot did not exist. And after it is broken into pieces, so powder, it, it doesn't exist because it goes back to clay. So what is what you call a, a, an earthen pot is nothing but a momentary phenomenon. So we superimpose the shape and form of a pot on clay and then you give it a name to distinguish that uh, clay pot from other utensils made of the same material. So before the production and after the destruction they have no reality. So here in this context of course another school of philosophy holding another view as something else to say. So Pura Paksha Pura Paksha actually means prima facie view, I mean the first reading of an argument or it could be uh, the view of uh, another uh, school of philosophy we does not agree with the views of Advaita. Murdadi karanasya tat karanasya cha tat karana vitirekena anubilabdhehi asatvam tat asatve cha sarva bhava prasanga idi ched. So here is an um, important argument. The argument is this, this mud or clay which serves as the cause of the pot and that cause can have another cause. So if the wooden pot, sorry, if the uh, clay pot or earthen pot is unreal, then earth cannot be unreal because the pot is unreal we understand because it's made from clay or earth. So if the effect is unreal then the cause of that effect cannot be real and the cause of that cause also cannot be real. 
So, Sarva Abhava Prasanga. In that case, what happens? Everything will have to be uh, termed as non existent. So, it, in a, you put in Vedantic perspective, if you say this world is unreal, this world of names and forms are unreal, then you have to admit the cause of this unreal world also should be unreal and the cause of that unreal cause of this world also should be unreal so everything becomes unreal it becomes sarvabhava so it can lead to this fallacy of argument the fall fallacial argument wrong argument is irrational argument everything is unreal so <coughs> that's the interpretation given here here of course before we go further we have to uh, uh, understand the meaning of asattum here. Asattum mentioned in this bhashya does not mean absolute unreality. What it means is something that is unreal from the highest perspective. So that's why Bhashigara said Nahi Sidoshnadi Sagaranam Pramanaihi Nirupimanam Vastu Sambhavati. Cold and heat and their causes are unreal when Pramanaihi Nirupimanam, when viewed from the highest standpoint of the absolute reality. But at the relative level, at the Vyavaharya level, they do have an existence. Bhashigara says elsewhere. We have to admit the reality of this world. We have to admit the empirical reality of this world. Be, till we realize that Atman is only reality. So, Pradhanmatma Vijnana Sarva Loka Vivakaranam Satyutu Vaputeki. It is a Prakshapna Seva. So, before you wake up, the dream experiences are real. We realize the unreality of dream experiences only when we come out of dreams. When we are dreaming, the dream objects are real. Similarly, when we are living in this world, when we are slowly doing spiritual practice, with the purpose of realizing ultimately the unreality of these empirical things by transcending them, by realizing our immortal nature that we are Atman. Before we reach that level of realization, we cannot just wish away the apparent reality of empirical experiences. So, Prat Brahmatma Vijnana Sarva Loka Vivakaranam Satyatu Till we realize this Brahman, we have to admit as if this world is real. So we have to do Nishkarma Karma. We have to practice unselfishness, purity, uh, all the essential disciplines of spiritual life. And practice Karma, Karma Yoga with a view to attain Chitta Shuddhi. Once we attain Chitta Shuddhi, then we automatically transcend this level. It is not something that we attain. It is a, the self-discovery of our true nature. We are not throwing something away. Rather, we are discovering the true nature that we inherently are. That's an important point, remember. <coughs> so, the word asattam here doesn't mean absolute unreality. It means mithya. And the word mithya has got a number of definitions in Vedantic polemical philosophical literature. It can be called anivachaniya. So, Brahma Satyam Jigat Mithya Jeevo Brahma Ivanapara. Jigat is mithya. It is something that we mistake to be real so long as we are within the realm of dvaida or ignorance. 
and something that we recognize or realize to be unreal when we transcend, when we realize the reality of Brahman. So, so in Vedanta, this world is not absolute reality like Brahman. At the same time, it is not absolute unreality either. So it could be called anivachaniya or indescribability or relativity. So uh, the word mithya is being defined by uh, great, the great post-Shankarite Advedins like Padmapada says Atyanta bhavatya sati asattva atyanta bhavarupam visishtam sadhyam sadasat anadhiyaranattum va mithyatum It is an important view of Padmapada in, in his famous book Panchapadika. And in Panchapadika, Vivaranam Prakashatma Yadi says, Pradibanna Upadhu Traigarika Nishedak Pradiyogittam Va Mithyattu. And uh, Prakashatman in the Vivaranam Prasthana again, he says, Jnana Nivartittum Va Mithyattu. It again comes in the Panchapadika Vivaranam. And Chitsukha Jaira and Chitsukhi Tattu Pradibhika says, Swasraya Nishtha Atyanta Bhava Pradiyogittam Va Mithyattu. And the fifth definition is, so the simple uh, essence of all these five definitions is this. Something that remains, that, that, or that is experienced or seen to be real at the relative level, but something that we realize to be unreal when we transcend it. When we look for this Mithya world, as we look for the cause of the earthen part, then we understand that this Mithya world, this Mithya world, this unreal world or the relative world doesn't exist the same way without change in the past, present and future. So that's why uh, I say this uh, Panchapadika Vivarana says, Pradibanna Bhadu Staika Adika Nishedha Pradiyo Uttam Va Mithyattu. So when we look for something that exists without any change in the past, present and future, then we realize this, this world of empirical experiences is not something that remains permanent without changes. It is changing every moment. Our mind changes, our attitude changes, our body changes, and this empirical phenomenal world also undergoes changes. So it doesn't remain unchanging in the past, present, and future, Trikala. It changes throughout its existence. So its existence is only relative. It is not absolutely real. But it is not absolutely unreal because we experience it at the Vyavakarika level. But it is not a Paramatthika reality, so it is not absolute reality either. So, that, that point is going to be explained. So, this objective Purabhakshin's view doesn't hold ground. Because by Asattvam, the Advedin does not mean absolute unreality. The Advedin only means it is Mithya. It is something that is subject to the changes. So it is not absolutely real. So what is not absolutely real is Mithya. But we talk about it because we very often may misinterpret this impermanent world as something permanent. As a child may not think that the pot would not exist, the pot did not exist before it was made. We may think that these pots remain unchanging. If you tell the Dvedin philosophers or Ramanujay Madhva philosophers that we are superimposing Nama and Ruba on the clay of the earth, so we call them different utensils. They would admit. They would admit that they have different names, different forms. So the uh, the, the 
the uh, at the prayogika level at the vyavaharika level we use them for different purposes so they do have a different entity uh, that's interpretation of the non advaitic philosophers but advaitins say essentially because they sub they are subject to changes they cannot be called absolutely real na sarvatra buddhi duyo balabdhi sad buddhi asad buddhi iti so bhashigara says such an objection cannot arise here because all experiences are constituted by a twofold consciousness that is sad buddhi that is the consciousness of the real and asad buddhi consciousness of the unreal So a pot exists now, you broke it and becomes is powder, it becomes clay. So now you say the pot is, but when you break it, you have to say the pot is not. So both is sad buddhi and is not a sad buddhi. It changes from one state to another state. So there is a change. So it is vibhijaradi, it, it, it undergoes changes. So whatever undergoes change, whatever undergoes a deviation is asat. And whatever remains unchanging is sat. Yad vishaya buddhi na vibhijaradi tat sat. Yad vishaya buddhi vibhijaradi tat asat idi. Sadasat vibhagi buddhi tantri sthide. So, when our consciousness, our awareness of an object does not change, and this is possible only with regard to Brahman or Atman, then it is Sat. And when it changes, it deviates, then it becomes, then it is called unreal it is asad buddhi the, the distinction between sad buddhi and asad buddhi often depends upon our consciousness sarvatrahi dve buddhi sarvaihi vilabhyate samanadhikarane we will explain samanadhikarana later bhashagara gives the examples nilot plavat san pataka san ghataka san pataka Sankhasti idi evam sarvatra. So, nilam utpalam is an example taken. Sanpadaga, sankhadaga, sankhasti idi evam sarvatra. So, we will explain this in the next class. The central, uh, uh, central point of today's discussion was uh, is a very important principle in Vedanta. Whatever undergoes changes, deviations, whatever is changing from time to time, from past to present and from present to future, is and cannot be called real in the absolute sense of the term. And from the highest perspective of Brahman, it is unreal if something changes from time to time. If it changes from past to present and pr from present to future, any kind of deviation, then it implies unreality. It is unreal. But unreal here does not mean absolute unreality. Unreal in this context means mithya that is relative. Just like, uh, like uh, the earthen pot the clay pot that exists for some time did not exist before it was made by a pot maker and would cease to exist when you break it and powder it it goes back to its clay state so it is not real but then it is not absolute and reality either because it exists for some time but it has no existence independent of earth similarly this world this changing world as world is unreal in the sense it is only relative it is changing all the time but the essence of this world is Brahman you look at this world without associating it 
with name and form, then you are looking at Brahman only. The Brahman you cannot look at, but then it is this world minus name and form and causation, it is Brahman. When you superimpose name and form on Brahman, then it is seen to be this world. So we will explain this later in the coming sessions. Thank you. Om Shanti 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 Hari Kiyo Tatsu Sri Ramakrishna Namaste.